Okay, any questions? I have put up assignment number seven this morning. Um, there are four problems there. But I think they are not very well, one may be long. Uh, based on the problem that we did in the class where we had three tanks in series. In this problem there are two tanks in series and uh, there is a level controller which you want to do. And I want you to go through the entire mechanics of developing the model, non-interacting system, developing the block diagram, transfer function, put in the control and uh, answer the question if you want to control the form. By my hand, I have not asked anything on well, for assignment, you can use MATLAB or Snailing, but I would encourage that you also do it by hand as a preparation for your final exam. But with assignment, you are welcome to use any, any tool. I'm not restricting you to do it by one. Next Friday. Yeah. Next Friday. And next Friday, I will have the last assignment. Eight would be the last one of them. Eight would be the last one. And there are a couple of problems on um, effective transfer function. A little bit more complicated, uh, not really very complicated, uh, block diagrams. How to develop an effective transfer function. And one on what I'm going to do today uh, the stability criterion. How do we determine whether it's a stable table without solving uh, the characteristic equation? Okay, so this is the last topic, but there are a few methods that we want to cover uh, to learn about the stability of a control system. Okay, so typically we are looking at a feedback control system like this with an effective, um, I guess it's always open with the wrong application. <laughs> Can I write on this one? So you have an effective process transfer function, which is second order, and a controller, and a measurement with a dynamic, a measurement dynamic. So a typical uh, feedback control system with a disturbance U and a set point R. So what we are interested in is how do we analyze the stability of such systems. We saw in the last lecture by simply increasing KC, the gain, controller gain, we can trigger the system from a stable to an unstable situation. Okay. So we want to learn about how to determine the stability boundary. What is the maximum value for KC uh, below which the system will remain stable? And uh, that's the first criterion we need to worry about, stability. Once we ensure stability, then we can look at other issues like the response time, the degree of overshoot, how do we control those things that we need to have the system as a stable system. And we saw that we can do an effective transfer function between C and R. We know how to do that. It's basically whatever is in the open loop between the input and the output uh, divided by 1 plus what is in the entire loop. Okay. So C over R, the effective uh, output to input is in this particular case given by G1, G2 divided by 1 plus G1, G2, H. G1, G2 is the one that is in the forward loop, and this is in the entire loop. Okay, the forward part in the numerator, and 1 plus the entire thing in the denominator. Then make a substitution for G1 and G2. In this particular case, you were given what they are, the functional form of that, and uh, simplify. 
So when you simplify that, what you'll find from the last class when we did the specific example, we saw why, for example, the effective one was cubic or our quartic one. In this particular case, the effective denominator is going to be a cubic because there is a two first order systems in the process and one in the measurement. Okay. So uh, you do the simplification and algebraic manipulation from here to here. Uh, by simply multiplying throughout by tau 1 s plus 1, tau 2 s plus 1, tau 3 plus s1. So this 1 gets multiplied by this entire factor. And in the denominator, this is the structure that you will always get. The denominator, what you get is tau 1 s plus 1, tau 2 s plus 1, tau 3 plus 1 plus k t. That k t is the controller gain. And as you change k c, the factors in the denominator, this you can factorize as something like, for example, s minus r1 times s minus r2 times s minus r3. Okay, so there are three, it's a cubic polynomial, so there are three roots. But these r1, r2, and r3 will depend on kc. Of course, they will also depend on tau1, tau2, tau3, but those are time constants, we know that. They're not going to change. But what you can change as a control engineer is kc. Okay. So as you change KC, the roots are going to move uh, in the complex plane of eigenvalues of the roots. Okay? So we will see today something called uh, the root criterion to determine when all the negative parts, uh, all the real parts of the roots are negative, under what conditions. We will develop a very simple algebraic rule. In the next class, we will look at something called the root locus method, which asks the following question. What happen, how do the curves of these uh, roots look like on the complex plane as you change Kc continuously? So the locus of these roots as you change Kc. The MATLAB has nice built-in tools that will generate those plots. So visually you can get an idea of as you change the control again, what happens to the stability picture. Okay? So what you need to understand at this stage is that for a feedback system, you can always uh, write something like in the denominator 1 plus g. And that is called a characteristic equation. So this entire term in the denominator, the roots of that equation are the ones that determine the stability. Okay. Any question, man? Why? If I answer the question, why do the roots of that determine the stability? Um, that, that is the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> what, what you're saying is that these are called, also called poles. And as S reaches those poles, uh, there are uh, things going to infinity. That's what you're saying. Um, but the answer that I'm looking for in terms of relating it to the eigenvalues, that is the key part. Okay? I want you to see the relationship between the 1 plus g term, 1 plus g, we are going to set this equal to 0 in the denominator. That is called the characteristic equation. You can always factor this in the form of s minus r1, s minus r2, s minus r3. Okay, so it's a polynomial. Polynomial has certain roots. So you can write them as product of those uh, factors. Now, r1, r2, r3 are the eigenvalues of some dynamical system. So when you are inverting from the Laplace domain to the time domain, what you need to do is you need to do partial fraction. Okay? So this step, if you're doing it by hand, uh, you need to, and getting the response in time domain by hand, you need to do partial fractions. And in each case, you will get something like A1 divided by S minus R1 plus A2 divided by S minus R2, etc. So if you have fourth degree polynomial, you're going to get fourth each term. And then using the Laplace table, you're going to invert this. So it's going to give you a term like A1 times e to the power R1t. And R1 can be complex. And the real part of R1 
has to be negative for stability. Okay. So yeah. Uh, why, why? Yeah. That's well, okay. That you, you are thinking about it in a way that can explain why it is not so. There are, there are situations where it may actually cancel out. Okay? Uh, but let's look at, suppose I have factored this out. Okay? So I have a polynomial, I have factored this. Okay? So if I'm writing the solution, the solution is going to be something like a1 times e to the power r1t plus a2 times e to the power r2t, etc. Okay? So r1 and r2 can be complex. right? So it is the real part of R1 and R2 that I'm looking at to see whether it is stable or not. So the only time when, if I have, um, if I have a positive root and a negative root, okay, the negative root will take it to zero as time goes to infinity. The positive one will always survive. Okay. So the only time when it will have a the negligible effect is if A1 goes to 0. Okay, if A1 goes to 0 and e to the power of something t goes to infinity, then the product is still undefined. Okay, so if A1 becomes extremely small, a very small number, then the positive unstable mode, which is due to the positive exponent, will have to wait longer before it catches up. So this term is, if it is positive, this term is going to infinity. Now, if this term goes to zero, if it is exactly zero, then we cannot determine. We need to do the L'Hopital's rule kind of a thing to see. Okay? But if it is a very small number, if the coefficient is a very small number, just a matter of time. If you wait long enough, it will eventually explode. Okay? So the coefficients A1, A2 really do not determine the stability. The stability is determined only by the roots. The roots of the polynomial, the real part of the roots. The imaginary part just gives you the oscillation. So I'm basically one more time talking about this relationship between eigenvalues and the characteristic shoes and the denominators. So we saw all these ideas for an open loop system where we didn't have any control. One example that you did in one of the assignments, the reactor problem. It had three steady states and one steady state was unstable. Okay? And we determined that by looking at the eigenvalues and saw that the eigenvalue was positive. Okay? So now we are saying the same idea applies, but we are putting a control action on that particular process. And even if the process is stable, the control action can trigger instability by choosing the wrong value of Kc. Okay? So the formalism, the mechanism is all the same. We're going to do it in Laplace domain and then invert, go to the time domain. And in the Laplace domain, when we get these characteristic roots, those are the same as the eigenvalues for the ordinary, corresponding ordinary differential equation. The only reason we choose to work with Laplace domain is everything is algebraic. I don't need to worry about differential equations. Okay. Uh, but I can always keep that in the back of my mind because whenever I want, I can go back to the time domain by doing the inverse. Any questions? Okay, yeah. Right. The locus tells you graphically, visually, how do these roots change as I change the control of game. Okay. So that's a really a very nice, powerful tool. Um, of course, to do this in the 40s and 50s when they didn't have computers, you need to do it by hand. Solve, solve the characteristic equation 1 plus g equal to 0. Remember, g will have k in it, kc in it. So resolve it many, many times for each value of kc and then plot them. But now MATLAB has a very nice tool, our locus. You just give it the transfer function, it plots the root locus plot for you. I'll talk about it a little bit more in the, uh, later. Okay. 
So the important thing, I guess, for you to observe is that uh, the character, well, you should know what a characteristic equation is. It is the denominator of the effective transfer function. And let me ask you another question. Will, will the stability differ if I make a step point change or if I have a disturbance? So I can excite the system one of two ways. Let's go back to this picture. Okay. I can excite the system by putting some disturbance here or I can excite the system by putting an impulse or a step change in the set point. Will the stability be the same or different? It should be the same, right? If you write the effective transfer function, that includes both. Here I just showed you the ratio C over R. Suppose I need to write this as C is equal to, okay, so uh, G1, G2 divided by 1 plus G1, G2, H times R. Okay, plus, I have at the same time a disturbance. What would be the transfer function for that? The disturbance is here. So it's simply G2, the open loop transfer function between those, divided by the whole thing in the loop, okay? 1 plus G1, G2H. So the denominator is the same, no matter whether the disturbance is coming from U or the step point change. So the stability of the dynamical system is determined only by the characteristic root of the denominator by setting that equal to zero, solving for all the roots. Okay. And the other thing that we need to notice is that one plus G term, one plus G term in general, will include or will depend on for a PIG controller all three numbers, KC, tau i, and tau d. Okay. So the question is, how is the stability affected by changes in the controller parameters? That is what design of control system is. When you think we are talking about design of control system, you want to ensure several things. One aspect is you want to make sure that none of the parameters that we have chosen here will cause it to go into the unstable region. Okay. So how do we do that? Let's just uh, do a few examples. Now, there are a few definitions, there are many definitions of a stable system, and this is, there is an important point here. One definition is, and these are the things that in the final exam I'll put in a short question for possibly, okay? Uh, a bounded input produces a bounded output. What does that mean? Right. The input that you put in, either a step point change or some impulse is allowed. Impulse is going to infinity and then coming back at the same instant. Because the energy content within the impulse is finite. Okay. So the impulse, the step change, the sinusoidal change, these are all bounded inputs. Can you think of an unbounded input that we have seen? In single link, all these two uh, block, blocks are available. Step change, impulse change, sinusoidal change. And ramp. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. A ramp input um, in the box you will see something like this. That increases the input continuously forever. Okay. So of course, if the input is going to blow up, the output has to blow up too. That doesn't mean that the system is unstable. Okay. That's why this definition catches such uh, situations. So the input has to be bounded, and that should produce a bounded output. Okay. When the input is bounded, the output should be bounded. So if you do a test where the input is not bounded, you can't really say anything about the stability or not. Because uh, it's caused by, you know, the system may be stable, the output goes unbounded because the input is unbounded. Okay. So a specific example for the same problem, I'm picking numbers. Tau 1 is 1, tau 2 is half, tau 3 is 1 third. Okay. And we're going to change values of Kc to different values and ask the question, is there a uh, value of Kc at which it becomes unstable? Okay. This you should be able to do. This, uh, construct a simulating diagram or do it in MATLAB. And I'm just showing you the final result here. When Kc equal to 3, I'm making a step change, a unit step change from 0 to 1. Okay. And what you find is for Kc of 3, 
the output is bounded. There is some sort of an oscillation, but you see that there is an offset because it's only a proportional controller, but it is bounded. Okay. What happens to kt equal to 9? Let's take that. So here is the curve. Okay, kt equal to 9. Is that stable or unstable? It's still stable. How would you say, why would you say that it is stable? The decreasing amplitude. Okay. That's a neutrally stable system. Okay, it's not, it doesn't decay, it doesn't go. When does that occur? You have a purely imaginary loop. Okay, the real part is zero, so it doesn't decay or grow, but you have a pair of purely imaginary rows that gives you a sine and cosine, sine and cosine oscillation. Okay? So the last one is kt equal to 12 in this figure, and you see there the amplitude actually growing with time. So what this tells you is somewhere between kt equal to 9 and 12, you have crossed the boundary. So there is a value of Kc between those two values where you will get a sustained oscillation. Okay. Now, if you're doing this kind of a work by simulink, all, uh, all you have to do is repeat those two brackets at the step on the last class using bisection method or something like that. So the question is, are there much more direct, clever methods that will tell us what is the precise value of Kc at which I have crossed the stability boundary, passing through the neutral stability curve? Uh, so this I'm just talking about the same thing when you have both the <coughs> step input and the disturbance, still the dynamics and the stability are governed by the same 1 plus g equal to 0. Okay? And you can always write this after simplifying as for a step change. In this case, I'm putting a step change in either one of them. So I get a 1 over s plus this factor. So the denominator can always be factored as s minus r1, s minus r2, s minus r n. Depending on the degree of the polynomial, you'll have that many rows. So a linear control system, we say, and watch the word linear. These are all definitions taken from the textbook. Okay. A linear control system is unstable if any, just one, okay, if any one group of its characteristic equation uh, is has a positive real part. Okay, that is, it is on the right of the imaginary axis. Otherwise, the system is stable. That is, all the roots uh, are having a negative real part. Okay. Now we said the linear control system. What happens if the system is non-linear? Most of the chemical structures are non-linear, right? Can we say anything about the stability? Answer is we really cannot. Okay, so all 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 we uh, can do through this uh, analysis is because we are linearizing the nonlinear model, so we can, when we say that a system is stable, the lesson that we need to learn from this key word, the linear is, when we say that a system is linear, it means that the disturbance that we put, remember, all these are deviation variables, so a disturbance from that, a step change, a unit step change, for example. That disturbance cannot be very large. If it is very large, and um, I find the linear system to be stable, that doesn't guarantee that the real system is going to be stable. It's an important lesson that we need to keep in mind. The blowing up of plants and uh, offshore structures, what, why do they happen? Because there are uncontrollable chemical reactions. Explosion is nothing but burning up of fuel, right? That's a, uh, uncontrollable situation. Okay, So if you get into an uncontrolled situation of a reactor, or combustion, anything like that, then you have an explosion. And those are all examples of where some control system has failed. Okay, um, And all systems are nonlinear. So the fact that you have chosen your design of KC such that you have guaranteed stability doesn't mean that the real system is going to be stable. It's only the linearized model is stable. So as long as the perturbations are small enough around that linear state, uh, you can expect the system to be uh, 
responding in a stable way. Um, remember one of the assignments that you did, the reactive problem, uh, you had three steady states. And one of the simulations that I asked you to do was third event. Okay? So when you are close to the unstable system, it, it goes to one of the stable systems. Now, if you take a steady state that is stable and perturb it by a small amount, you'll find that the system, that, the stable system, the, the response to the same steady state. But if you take the same steady state and put a large enough disturbance initially, what you'll find is that it goes to the sometimes the other steady state. Okay? So if there are two steady states, it can be kicked from one steady state to other steady state by large perturbation. So, so the lesson I want you to get from this important concept of a linear controller, disturbances must be small for the statement to be true. Like when you say that a system is stable, I have designed a stable system, it is valid only when I have small disturbances, okay, or I make small step changes. Another problem that I gave you, I think, was a tank, a vertical tank and a horizontal tank. And each one of them is carefully chosen to illustrate this point. Now, if in the horizontal tank, the nonlinearity is so high. So if you make a step change and you go far away from the steady state around which you have step, uh, linearized it, the dynamic changes. Okay? So you should go back and look at those examples now that you have a better vantage point to study these things, to understand these things. Okay? So when you're doing it, probably you're just getting the results, but now is the time to go back and why did we do these problems? One particular problem with multiple study states, the other one with different degrees of nonlinearity. So as you go away from a linearized steady state, so the degree of nonlinearity in the model is large, a large perturbation will make the linear model invalid. So it will make the control system that you designed based on that also of limited the range of applicability. Okay? Any questions for that? These are some difficult concepts but important concepts. Any questions? So this diagram we have seen before, I'm just reiterating it, but now the same diagram but with, with the control system built in, okay? So here you have uh, a purely uh, negative rail part, so that gives rise to an exponential decay, okay? Then you have a complex but with a negative rail part, okay? A2 is the negative rail part, so that gives you an oscillation but a decaying oscillation. That's a stable steady state. Okay. Then you have uh, a neutral state where there is only an imaginary part. The real part is zero. The real part is zero. The dynamics of that is a sustained oscillation, neither decays nor grows. And there are always pair of them. Okay, because the original problem is uh, having only real coefficients, so this is always occurs in pairs. Now this is a particular point. What is happening there? The system is just staying there. Okay, whatever excitation that you give, the eigenvalues are such that it's not going to respond. Okay, so uh, it's a special case of a neutrally stable system. Okay? And then the real unstable system is uh, this one. Okay, so you have a positive real part, A4 or positive. By positive, I mean I am in the right half plane. So this entire plane is unstable. If any of the eigenvalues are in the right half plane, that means I have an unstable system. Okay? So then you get this growing exponential or a special case if it is on the pure axis, then it's a pure exponential growth. No matter what the input is, as long as the input is bounded, these are all the possible responses, dynamic responses that you can get. Now, for the root locus, the concept of a root locus, what does that root locus plot tell you? It tells you that if, for example, one value of Kc, okay, Kc equal to 3, I get uh, these two as a roots. Now, if I change Kc to 4, these roots may become like this. Change Kc to 5, the roots become like this. Kc to 6, it becomes like this, for example. So I can draw a curve as Kc changes. Okay? And that is called the locus, the locus of the roots. Okay? 
So the roots are dynamically changing if I change the control parameters. So if I'm a control engineer and tuning it, I'm making these roots move along in the complex plane. And what do I want to do? I want to look at, for example, the roots are not going like this, but the roots are uh, going like this at a change Kc. Okay? Then I want to make sure what is the value of Kc at which the root has crossed. That is my stability boundary. But if the roots behave like this, then I'm fine. So all, all the values of Kc are still in the stable region. Then I can look at how can I increase the response time, how can I keep the overshoot small. Those are the other criteria, secondary criteria, that you can use to tune the parameters. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Well, yeah, right. So basically, our starting point is always something like this: dy dt equals f of y. Okay. Now this could be a vector, meaning I have two equations, right? So when I'm talking about the steady state solution, I'm going to set f of y equal to zero and solve for the steady state. The first point that you need to appreciate is that a nonlinear equation like this can have multiple solutions. What is the solution to this curve mean? It simply means when I plot f of y uh, versus y, the curve does something like this. So there are two values of y for which that equation is equal to zero. Okay? That is the nature of nonlinear equation. A linear equation is just a straight line can cut only one time. But even if it is a parabola, it can cut at least twice. Right? So all nonlinear equations can have multiple states. The next question is I can take each one of these steady states and linearize and build a linear model around each one of these steady states. And your question is if I, for example, start with this steady state and then I go back to the dynamic model and I put a perturbation on the system, okay? should it go back? This is a disturbance. Okay? So I put a disturbance. So should the system go back to the original steady state or should it go to a different steady state? Both are possible. What determines? That's what you're asking, right? It will never go to an unstable system because unstable system by nature will drive away. Even if you start very close to an unstable system, the, as you integrate using ODE 4.5, this equation, putting as your initial condition the unstable steady state. See, if you suppose let's have these two, uh, let's make it interesting. I have three steady states. Okay? This is a typical reactive problem. Okay? Oh, we cannot see that, sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. So you're setting f of y equal to zero. You solve for all the values of y that will satisfy that equation. You find that there are three values. Okay? And for this one, it is stable. For this one, it is stable. For this is one, it is unstable. How do you determine that? By the eigenvalue. Okay? So suppose this is the scenario. Okay? And so you go back to the dynamic equation and you integrate that using ODE45 with an initial condition. Suppose you pick the initial condition to be somewhere there. Okay? So the, as you integrate, it will go to the steady state. So now we are plotting y versus time. I'm starting with some initial condition and it goes to a steady state. Call this S1, S2, and U1. Okay? So it goes to S1. I'm starting with some initial condition, which is close enough to S1. So as I integrate, it goes to S1, the steady state. And at the steady state, dy dt equal to 0. That's why I get the result for life, right? Now, even if I start close enough to U1, because U1 is unstable, what you will find is another graph. I'm plotting y versus t again. But my initial condition is U1 the unstable steady state. It'll, ideally, we should satisfy the equation f equal to zero, right? Because I have found this unstable steady state by setting f equal to zero, right? So if f equal to zero, that means dy dt equal to zero, right? 
fact, there are always disturbances, small disturbances in the problem, and that will cause this to move away and go to either S1 or S2. What does that depend on? That depends on the nature of the initial disturbance. Okay. So we call S1 and S2 stable solutions as attractive. They will attract all the trajectories in their neighborhood. And U1 as a repeller. So it just repels. No matter how close you are to it, it's going to be directed away from that when you're integrating that equation. So if you want to really get to S2, you need to start with an initial condition that is close enough to S2. Then the trajectory will go to S2. Now, to answer that final question between small disturbance and large disturbance, okay? So when I said you have to be close enough to S2, that means there is a region of attraction, there is some region like this, any point that starts within that will go to S2. Similarly, there is a region around S1, okay? If you are within that region, it will go to S1. But if you go far away from that, if you have a large enough disturbance from here, then it may go to S2. Okay. So that is the nature of the nonlinear problem. When I say large enough disturbance, you cannot really put a criterion. You cannot draw this curve that easily. Say if you are within this, you are going to go to this. This is very difficult to draw that map. So only conceptually we can say that there is a region around which the, prop, the S1 will attract. Any starting conditions within that will be attracted to S1. But where is that boundary is not an easy task to answer. But these are all more complicated things that you will explore in greater detail in a graduate level control course. For our purposes, I don't want you to leave this course without realizing that what we have said is for a linear system, the stability of a linear system. So I don't want you to leave the idea that I've designed a stable system is going to work for all conditions. That's not true. Then you might have a plan that blows, blows up on you, right? So the idea that it is stable for small perturbations is an important one. Okay. So any other questions? This is an important figure for you to understand. Eigenvalues and where they are and what that determines the dynamic response. And then the next top the concept that we're going to superpose on that is this idea of a root locus on that. So how do the roots change as they change a control parameter? Okay? And particularly for what value they cross this vertical red line. That is the boundary stability boundary. And all these are for linear systems. Okay, let's do a few examples. Okay. Here uh, the same problem, G1 is 10 times 0.5 S plus 1 over S, G2 is 1 over 2 S plus 1, H1, the dynamic uh, me measurement is simply 1. Now, let's talk about this. Is that a first order system? What is the order of the system? Where would that kind of a transfer function come from? A first order differential equation will always give you a transfer function like this. If I have a differential equation like dx dt equals uh, r plus a1x equals to u1. Okay. When I do the Laplace transform, I'm always going to get a transfer function like this. This is what we call a first order transfer function, derived from a first order system. Okay. But here, what do you notice? There is a numerator. Okay. So this cannot come from a first order system. Where would it come from? Have you seen an example of that? We have not directly seen any physical example, but we have seen one example where there is a time delay. Time delay is given by e to the power tau ds. And we can approximate that by a parity approximation, which gives you both numerator and denominator. Okay? So one such system could give you a transfer function like that. Now, given a transfer function like this, our question is determined if the system is stable or not. Okay? For that block diagram. Okay, the block diagram that I showed you earlier. So you find the g in the denominator, which is the product of all the transfer functions in the loop, g1, g2, h, and then the characteristic equation. This you should be able to do in an exam. Okay? Given a block diagram, we know how to develop a block diagram, but now given a block diagram, 
find an effective transfer function, take the denominator of that, and 1 plus g is the denominator of that effective transfer function, and solve for the roots of both. Okay? So it's simply a matter of substituting for g, which is g1, g2, h, and so you have 1 plus 10 times 0.5 s plus 1 divided by x times 2 s plus 1. Set that equal to 0, and again factor that, so multiply this and simplify, and eventually you will get a polynomial. The polynomial in this case happens to be f square plus 3 s plus 5. Okay. In general, there will be some Kc appearing here because we don't want to substitute the Kc value. In this case, we have substituted it. Okay. So the roots of this are, we should be able to call a quadratic equation. So the roots are minus 1.5 plus minus j times square root of 11 over 2. So the system stable. Obviously, this is stable. What kind of a response do you expect from this? Sinusoidal decay. Because e to the power, this j will give you sine and cosine. If I ask you the question, what is what would be the frequency that you would expect? Where would you get that number? By that, what do I mean? If I plot this, I'm saying I'm going to get something like this decay, right? So I'm asking what is the wavelength or what is the frequency? No. Related to this. Right? Why? Because if this is the rule, the solution is going to be written as e to the power minus 1.5 plus j times square root of 11 over 2t. Right? That will be that in the time domain, that's how the solution will look like. So this you can split it up into two parts, e to the power minus 1.2 multiplied by e to the power square root of 11 over 2jt. Okay? So it is this part that ensures that it decays to zero. It is this part that gives you the sine and cosine. So when you write it in sine and cosine, what will this be? It will be sine square root of 11 over 2 t plus uh, j times cosine of square root of 11 over 2 times t. So the frequency is related to the square root of 11 over 2. You can extract that information from there. Okay, any questions on that? That's a fairly simple problem, okay, but, but it is for a feedback control system. Now the question is, okay, Over two pi. That would be a two pi. It would be a two pi factor. That's why I said it's related to that. So it's sine two pi omega t. If you write it like that, okay, then omega would be the frequency. Yeah. My memory is older than you. Right? Older than you, right? Uh, I think it is sine plus. Cos plus I sign, maybe. Cos plus I sign, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Change that. <laughs> and one promise that I make you anything that I don't remember, I don't expect you to remember either. It's in the formula sheet. Okay. Now the next question that we want to ask is, can I determine the stability without having to solve for the roots? Well, if it's a quadratic, it's easy, I can solve it. If it's a cubic, if it's a MATLAB, I can always ask it to solve it, right? And the question is, can I determine that stability without having to solve a polynomial for all the roots? Okay? And this was developed before the age of computers. So uh, Nowadays, you don't need. We have MATLAB, we just say roots and then pack the coefficient with the polynomial, it will give you all the roots. Okay? Um, but still, it is it has educational value in terms of the thought process that goes into answering that question. And the system is stable or not, by simply looking at the coefficients of the polynomial without having to solve it. And number two, you will see that even today it is useful because you can do parameter studies. Like you can leave KC as a symbol and answer the question for what value of KT the system will become unstable. 
So the root uh, test does not locate the roots. It simply answers the question, are there any roots in the positive, uh, with the positive real part? Okay. So our starting point is going to be simply polynomials. We're going to learn something about polynomials. So always the denominator can be written as a polynomial of degree n with n plus 1 coefficients, a0 s to the power n, a1 s to the power n minus 1, etc. And always make a0 positive. If it is negative, multiply it rows by minus 1 to make it positive. Okay. And what we are going to do is we are going to construct a table called the root table and then examine the number of sign changes in that table. And that is directly related to the number of roots on the right hand side of that uh, plane. So it's a recipe. Okay. So it's stated in the form of a theorem, but it's basically a recipe that we need to form. The first necessary condition for the root test to apply is that all these coefficients, a0, a1, a2, an, must be positive. If the polynomial coefficient, any one of them is negative, immediately uh, you know that there is at least one root that's on the right hand side. Okay. So the first statement is that it is necessary that all these be positive for all the roots to lie in the left half plane, in the left half plane. It's necessary, but it is not sufficient. What does that mean? It's a necessary condition, but it is not a sufficient condition. Meaning, if I have all these with a positive, it does not guarantee that all the roots are on the left half plane. Okay? It, it, it must be true. It must be true for all of them to lie, but if, it is all, if the, all of them are positive, you might still have, if all these coefficients are positive, you might still have one or two roots on the right hand side. So there is another test that we need to apply. So the very first test that you have to apply, if you are given a polynomial, is examine all the coefficients. If they are all positive, then you can go to the next step. If not, you already know that this is going to be stable. Okay? The next test is construct this so-called root array. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to organize the coefficients in the polynomial in the first two rows. Okay? As A0, A2, A4, A6, etc. The first row. Then the next one, you take all the odd ones. A1, A3, A5, A7. These are all given given from the polynomial or you have found out by writing the characteristic equation. We are not going to solve the polynomial, but we are going to do some simple calculations that fill this table in a particular way. So this is calculated. From this point on, all the numbers D1, D2, D3, C1, C2, C3 are all calculated using a simple rule. For example, D1 will be calculated like this. This times this minus this times this. So similarly, C1 will be B2 uh, will be calculated using always the previous two rows, but using A1 with A4 and A0 with A5. Okay, so let's continue like that, filling all the numbers on the third row. Then go to C C1. Okay, C1 is going to be calculated by taking B1 with A3 minus A1 with B2. Okay. Again, you don't have to remember this. I will write out in the formula sheet. But you should be able to apply this. So construct a table like that, using only the coefficients in the first two rows, and check for sign changes along this. If you find any sign change, that means that there is one root on the right hand side. Okay. So, for every sign change, there will be one root on the right hand side of that uh, complex plane for the roots, for the eigenvalues. Am I making myself clear? Negative, right. Yeah. The rule will apply whether you have even number of coefficients or not. Then you will put a sign as zero. Okay, so I compute the elements according to these rules. B1 is calculated as A1, A2 minus A0, A3. Okay, and I remember the way uh, simply across. Okay, just like uh, 
diagram, A1 times A2 minus A0 times A3. Something that they have learned in determinant calculation, something like that, same pattern. Okay. So, what is the part of that? You're finding, yeah, you're filling the entire table. <laughs> no, no, it's not a calculation of the determinant. The pattern, the pattern I'm saying, if you have a two vector matrix, you find the determinant by doing the cross term. It's a fraction. Similar, Similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is divided. Sorry, I forgot that part. It is divided by your, that's important too. Okay. So the pattern is just the cross product, subtract, and then divide by A1. Okay. Um, B3 will be divided by A1. Always it is divided by A1. Okay. So this is also divided by A1. Okay. So B3, for example, would be what? A3, it's not A3, watch out, always A1, the first one is always from the first one, first column, okay, so it's A1 multiplied by A6 minus A0 multiplied by A7, if A7 is not there, it's 0, so it is 0, okay, and divided by A1, yeah. Again, I don't expect you to remember this. I will put the pattern, but you should be able to interpret the pattern and extend it because the table is not completely told. Okay? And follow the same pattern for other rows. And there are three theorems that come from that. I stated as a possible theorem. Okay? The necessary and sufficient condition for all roots of the characteristic equation to have negative real parts, that is a stable system, is that all elements of the first column of the root table must be positive and non-zero. They are all positive, there is no sign change that guarantees you that all the roots are on the negative left out. Okay. That means the system is stable. Okay. If some of the elements in the first column are negative, then the number of roots with a positive real part that is unstable, that is in the right half plane, is equal to the number of sign changes. So what does that mean? You need to be careful in interpreting that. Suppose I give you the first column set of numbers, that is 5, minus 2, 4, and 3. How many sign changes are there? Two. So there are two rules, okay, on the right hand side. Okay. How many sign changes are there? Still two. <laughs> Still two, right? But if I had given you this, 5, minus 2, 4, minus 3, and there are four. Okay, there are four rows on the right hand side. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go to the last one. Last. Eventually, we'll have only one number. Okay. So it's probably three in this case. Right. Thank you. Okay. So now, if one pair of roots is on the imaginary axis, that is a very important point, right? When the roots cross from the left half plane to the right half plane is the stability boundary. So there is a special case for that. If one pair of roots are on the imaginary axis, on the imaginary axis, then you will find that one row of the root table becomes zero. Identically, all the elements in one row will be zero. That's how you will know. Okay? And then you take the numbers from the previous row, there will be two numbers from the previous row, and take those coefficients at C and D, plug it into this, and solve the quadratic, that will give you the imaginary part of those roots. That is related to the frequency. Okay? So you can get a lot of information about stability boundary, about the frequency, by constructing this simple truth. So I took a lot of time. So I'll do a few examples in the next class, and then we'll move on to the root locus class method.